the lost tribes of Israel. Lost? Really? Greetings, I'm David Brett here with Roger Norman, a special guest that we have for you today uh, who is presenting the Lost Tribes of Israel. This is the second in a four-part program series and uh, today we're going to look at uh, Judah. Uh, a lot of people think of Israel as being the Jews, but that's not necessarily true, is that Roger? That's correct. And now let's look at the division into two nations. The northern ten are not Jews. Jacob or Israel had how many sons? Twelve. And the Jews derived their name from which son? Judah. They were one united nation under three kings, Solomon, uh, David, and Saul. Well, what happened about 930 B.C. immediately after the death of Solomon? Uh, there's division. Rehoboam becomes king of uh, Judah, Jeroboam king of Israel, the northern ten. Now actually this had been brewing some time before. There was a civil war even while David was king between the two nations. Israel became known as the northern ten, Judah the southern two tribes composed of Judah and Benjamin, a few Levites. After the split they almost immediately go to war. But uh, and out of Second Chronicles, now when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem he assembled the house of Judah and Benjamin to fight against Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam. But the word of Yahweh came, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah. You shall not go up and fight against your relatives. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. Yahweh brought it about as a result of the sin of Solomon. Israel, the northern ten, sometimes called Ephraim, sometimes Samaria after their capital, Ephraim being the capital of uh, the leading tribe by the way, sometimes the house of Joseph, all refer to the northern ten. Judah and Benjamin merge. Now Asa, king of Judah, had an army of 300,000 from Judah and 280,000 from Benjamin. In Mordecai in Esther chapter 2, now there was a Jew in Susa whose name was Mordecai, a Benjamite. We can again see that merger. Paul, Acts uh, 22, Philippians 3, I am a Jew born of in Tarsus of Cilicia, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. But you will never see, I am a Jew of the tribe of Ephraim, Manasseh, Asher, Reuben, Dan, etc. It's not there. Two houses develop. You'll see that in, in the New Covenant. Uh, when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah. Isaiah 11, they're distinct and separate until when? The last days. Ephraim, the northern, original uh, northern ten, will not uh, be jealous of Judah, the southern two, and Judah will not harass Ephraim. When is that going to happen? Isaiah 11, when the wolf and the lamb, the lion and the calf lie down together in effect, and that has not happened yet. Future reunification in Ezekiel uh, 37, speaking of the two sticks, Behold, I'll take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, the tribes of Israel, there's our northern ten, combine it with the stick of Judah, southern two, make them one stick, and I will make them one nation in the land. And they'll no longer be two nations, no longer be divided into two kingdoms. What Yahweh divides, only He can reunite. Extremely important. And when's it going to happen? Not until the last days when David is resurrected and Yahweh's sanctuary is with us forever. Let's look at the captivity of Israel. 1 Chronicles 5, So the Elohim of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, and that was his name before uh, it was, uh, he took the throne, king of Assyria, and he carried them away into exile, the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So here's two and a half tribes going into exile, and brought them to uh, these cities to where they are to this day. 
And this book is written, uh, Chronicles and Kings, around 450 B.C., almost 200 years after they were carried away exile, and they're still there to this day. Sargon II, 721, some say 722 B.C., quashed the rebellion and took uh, away the final uh, number of captives from uh, Samaria, the northern, uh, uh, the capital of the northern ten, 27,290. The biblical account, 2 Kings 17, then the king of Syria invaded the whole land and went up to Samaria and carried them away to, into the cities of the Medes. Keep that in mind as we'll look at their migrations and movements. How many were left after 721 B.C.? So Yahweh was angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. None was left except the tribe of Judah. Let's look at the captivity of Judah. It occurred 116 years later, beginning about 605 B.C. And uh, some people might think, well, when the Jews returned, the Israelites returned with them. No, 42,000 some odd returned, uh, there is recorded in Scripture. And uh, with their servants, it brings it up to about 50,000 uh, returnees of the Jews. But this was to fill the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah regarding after the 70 years. And the restoration of the land after 70 years is addressed to Judah, not to the northern ten. Extremely important. Co-mingling? Well, previously in approximately 940 B.C., right after the division, some of all the tribes, they do indeed go down to Judah, as recorded there in Second Chronicles. But from the contents we gather, they were only there three years. Rehoboam was so bad, he said, we've had enough of this character, we're out of here. There was more mingling, we'll see later in another section in Second Chronicles uh, 34 and 35, but that only lasted uh, for approximately 28 years as the Scythians, who were then known as, uh, who were then Israelites, uh, invade the land for a while. Some will point to Anna, the prophetess, and her uh, when she was there with her intercessory prayer ministry. But question, uh, and they'll say, well, hey, doesn't that mean she was absorbed into Judah? Question, does the fact that some Americans live in China mean that these Americans have been absorbed by the Chinese? Don't think so. I know a, a woman from Dallas who teaches English in uh, Jerusalem. Does that make that Gentile woman a Jew because she's living there teaching English? Don't think so. Same principle with Anna. Did Israel, the ten, return? Second Chronicles 10, 2 Kings 12. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David, there's the two nations, to this day. And again, that's written 450 B.C., approximately 100 years after uh, some of the Jews returned to the land. Josephus, the historian, writing about 93 A.D., there are but two tribes, he's speaking of Judah and Benjamin, in Asia and Europe, subject to the Romans, while the ten tribes are beyond Euphrates until till now, and are an immense multitude, not to be estimated by number. Beyond Euphrates, well, here's our land of Israel, here's the Euphrates River in this general area here, so he's saying they're beyond the Euphrates up in this area. We'll see that later. Innumerable. That's fulfillment of Hosea chapter 1, where Yah and which was compiled about uh, 10 years after the final captivity. And Yahweh says, you're not my people and you're not my Elohim, and I'm not your Elohim. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And then the place where it was said of them, you're not my people, Hey, in His mercy it will be said of them, You are the sons of the living Elohim. The division, separation was of Yahweh. They were divided. So does it sound like He's going to have to be the one who puts them back together? They cannot intermix and do something contrary to His will. Still separate in the last days. Revelation 7 mentions each of the separate tribes. Genesis 49, the so-called reading of the will by their father uh, Jacob before he died. He says, Gather together and I'll tell you what shall befall you in the last days. And then he describes Zebulun, you're going to be dwelling by the sea and you're going to be a haven for ships, etc. And then he has points for each one of them. And Joseph, you're going to be a fruitful bough. 
uh, blessings of, uh, you want to have the blessings of the heaven above, blessings of the deep that lie beneath. Each one had these separate blessings spoken upon them. Ezekiel 47, the land's going to be divided according to tribes in the last days. It's probably in the millennial kingdom here. Thus says Yahweh Elohim, these are the borders with which you shall divide the land as an inheritance among the twelve tribes. Joseph, you're going to get two portions. Here's something pretty good for the strangers, the non-physical uh, Israelites. Uh, they get to select which tribe they want to live w uh, with, and then in fact they get to select uh, the land that they want. Good deal for them. Now keep this in mind. Sometimes Israel means all twelve tribes. And sometimes it means only the uh, uh, ten northern tribes. You've got to look at the context in the Bible, the passage, and see which one it's speaking of. Some folks say, but hey, Roger, I've heard that there are small, scattered tribes here and there. Well, let's take a look at that and consider it for a moment. Here are the American Indians. They're sometimes contended uh, to be uh, the lost tribes and the uh, Mormons and South African or small African and small uh, Asian tribes. And you've seen that uh, in videos and DVDs uh, depicting these small tribes as uh, the, the lost tribes. But my question is this, can we connect the dots? For example, are they Genesis 27 qualified? That being, are they grain and wine exporters? Do they have that blessing? Do they possess the fatness that is the best of the earth? Usually they're living in those video scenes in desert areas, wondering how they survive. Do people serve them? Where are the blessings of Genesis 13 and 28 as the sand of the sea and the dust of the earth? So, in summary, the Israel, all 12 tribes, was divided into two separate nations following the death of Solomon. The division was of Yahweh. He is the one that brought it about. And there's no evidence that I could find that Israel was ever absorbed into Judah or uh, the Jews into Israel. It just did not happen. And by the way, I went to uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary when I began to study this project. I checked out every book that I could find on the Lost Tribes, and they had several. And uh, I, I'm thoroughly familiar with uh, the fact that there is no absorption of the ten back into uh, Judah to become uh, all, to in effect have all twelve in the, in the tribe of Judah today. There is biblical evidence that Yahweh will keep them separate and, uh, and then until reunited by Him when in the last days. So, Israel, the northern ten, is not Jewish not Judah. Yet, Judah remains, of course, part of the overall twelve, that's uh, Israel. But Judah is not part of the northern ten. Let's keep that in mind as we go through our presentation. Thank you. We'll be right back. The appointed times or feasts of Leviticus chapter 23 were kept in the Old Testament, were kept in the New, and will be kept in the coming Kingdom. The question is, why would we not keep them now? To learn more, request your free in-depth study entitled Biblical Holy Days. Write to YAIY 2963 County Road 233, Kingdom City, Missouri 65262 or visit online at yaiy.org. You may also call toll free 1877-642-4101. Eliyahu will come and restore all things before the second coming of Yahshua the Messiah. What does this mean? Find the answer to this question by receiving our free pamphlet, This is the Eliyahu Message. To do this, visit us online at www.yaiy.org or write to YAIY 2963 County Road 233, Kingdom City, Missouri 65262 or call us toll free at 1-877-642-4101. There are so many distractions today. The internet, television, uh, these type of things, taking us away from the Word of Yahweh, in which we should be uh, spending time in, reading the Word, 
and finding out what we should be doing as a people. Find out more at YAIY.org. Welcome back. We're here with special guest Roger Norman, and we're talking about the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, Roger, uh, as we continue, I think we're going to find what you have following uh, very interesting. Thank you, David. Let's look now look at the migrations of these tribes. And by way of review, Genesis 28, Jacob, your descendants are going to spread out to the north, east, west, and south. 1 Kings 3, they were as the dust of the earth, innumerable during the time of Solomon. And yet, about 250 years later, they were down to only about 40,000. What had happened? Where had they gone? I submit they began to flee and emigrate as to their Israelite colonies, which had already been established for them. Let's consider Carthage and its Israelite origin. Carthage is located about uh, directly east, uh, directly west, I'm sorry, of uh, the land of Israel in modern day Tunisia. You remember the drought in Israel during the time of Ahab and it extended into Tyre and Sidon to such an extent that the people were ready to starve. Elijah and the widow, you remember that story? As per author Steve Collins, Israel's population faced a brutal, simple choice. Hey, we can stay in Israel and die, or we can migrate elsewhere and live. At that time, Carthage was founded, and there's evidence that Queen Dido of uh, Tyre uh, was the uh, head of uh, the group that founded that. It was founded about 840 B.C., and she is said to have founded, the, uh, founded that city, and she's uh, reported to have been the grandniece of Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab of Israel. Its name, Hebrew name, uh, literally means new town. The Greeks car called it Carthagon, and the Romans Carthago, so uh, we can see how it then uh, developed on into Carthage of today. Their language there in Carthage was Hebrew. The chief magistrates or judges were called Shofatim, the Hebrew word for judges. They had no kings until the fall of Israel. Now, why is that important? If today Australia, Canada would uh, have them a king or a queen, would that be proper? No, There's, uh, they're a colony, and the, the queen is in England, uh, the mother country. Well. There was no king there in Carthage until the fall of Israel. And then they had their kings after that time. There were colonies in Europe. Uh, an author, uh, 1878, the Celtic harbors teemed with craft of Carthage. For several centuries, Carthaginians used the harbors up in that area. The Celtic inhabitants of those countries allowed them to settle peaceably among them. Why? I submit they were kinfolks. They had priests called Kohanim, the, he, the, uh, and the high priest, Rab Kohanim, i.e., the, the Hebrew words, very identical Hebrew words for a priest and high priest. No Jews were in Carthage. Why is that important? During this time, they were having uh, war after war after war with each other, the northern ten and uh, Israel, uh, uh, Judah, the southern uh, two. So it would be like committing suicide for a Jew to go to Carthage. They had the initials BRT on their coins, covenant, the Hebrew word for covenant. They knew they were covenant people. They were wheat kings of the area. What's the significance of that? They had the blessings, abundance of uh, uh, grain that they uh, could uh, export. They had tophets, which uh, is places where they buried the dead bodies of the human sacrifices. Well, that was what they also had, and you'll see it mentioned in Jeremiah 7 and 19, bad news. And that's what led to the Carthage, uh, to the fall of Carthage, was their Baal worship, which leads to child sacrifice. Bad. And there's the passage in Jeremiah 7, speaking of uh, that Tophet there in the land, uh, back in the land of Israel, where they burned their sons and their daughters in the fire. That which Yahweh did not command, did not enter in his mind that they'd do such a terrible thing as that. Now, here is a uh, photograph of the ex, uh, excavations of the Tophet there in uh, Carthage. For size comparison, here is a man standing right here. And a very large area you'll see right here. And it had nine levels. And uh, it was, and here's some uh, 
jugs containing uh, the bones and remains of some of the children that were sacrificed and then cremated. More of level after level. And it got so bad that Yahweh raised up the Romans who then defeated them and they had to go, they had to leave. Well, when the nation fell, where did they go? Uh, author Steve Collins, I think, rightly concludes they went to Europe where their relatives were. John Francis Campbell, a prolific writer, back in the 1800s says the tales and stories that uh, are in Scotland, where'd they come from? They came from Carthage. The Celts, who were they? John Francis Campbell again says they came from the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. And, I, and yes, there's a lot of debate about where the Celts came from, but I agree with him. There is evidence that they did indeed come from there. Peter Ellis, writing in his book, says that the Totha de the Danans, that is the children or tribe of Dan, is recorded in early histories in Ireland. And the Irish, he says, can trace their kings back to 1015 BC. Hey, that's mighty close to Israel's first king, Saul. Here's another law that the uh, uh, Celts had. He states on page 43 that the early Irish had a law for daughters to inherit lands if there were no male inheritors of the deceased. That's identical with Numbers chapter 36. They carried that law over with them. Here's an interesting statement in the March 1987 issue of U.S. News and World Report. They quote, then New York Mayor Ed Koch, head of the St. Patrick's Day Parade, as, he was, as they, he was discussing his presence at the head of the parade. And he quoted as saying, it's part of my roots. The ten lost tribes of Israel, we believe, ended up in Ireland. Well, hey, I would agree with him that part of them did, uh, but there are other parts that went all over uh, Europe. I'd love to talk to him, see what he knows about that subject. The Milesians, who were they? Story of Ireland, 1898. They were an Eastern people. They had passed across the wide expanse of southern Europe, bearing aloft through all their wanderings their sacred banner, which symbolized to them their origin and the blessings and promise given to their race. The sacred banner of the Milesians was a flag on which was represented a dead serpent and the rod of Moses. They had preserved the story of their ancestors being bitten by poisonous serpents who were healed when they employed the aid of Moses, Milesians. And there is a depiction of their sacred banner. Were the Celts Israelites? Steve Collins, Celtic Spain, Portugal were named Iberia in honor of Iber. There's that name again, meaning to cross over, the father of the Hebrews. And Boyd Dawkins, 1880, states that the Iberian race extended beyond the borders of Spain. They were, to a great extent, intermingled with the Celts in Western Europe. I submit they were part of the Celts. BRT, the Covenant. A portion of Celtic France came to be known as Brittany, a name of Hebrew origin, i.e. the Hebrew letters for covenant being B, R, and T. They had the blessings. Look at that torque. That they, can make, that they made out of solid gold. Absolutely beautiful. The flagon, gold inlined, beautiful. They were not dummies. They had the blessings. Well, hey, what did the Celts call themselves? They called themselves Qumri, the official Assyrian name for Israel. The Assyrians called them Qumri, they, a term they derived from Israel's king Amri. Alat Summers, 17th century historian, the Britons call themselves Kumaro, Kumaro, and Kumarai. Sir John Rise, both countries, speaking of Wales and Britain of the Kumarai, were for some times called Cambria, pronounced as, as if spelled Kumarai. In the language of the Saxon Chronicle, it became Cumberland, the land of the Kumri or Kumarai. The Americana, states that these Celtic migrations occurred as early as 1000 B.C. and as late as 600 B.C. In other words, the Celtic migration began during Israel's golden age under Kings David and Solomon and continued through the time of the uh, uh, kingdom, at the time of the kingdom of Israel uh, fell uh, and uh, Judah and, uh, 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 and Jerusalem were taken captive. 
Let's now look at the Greeks of Sparta. Who were these characters? Where'd they come from? Well, in the book of 1 Maccabees, there's correspondence between the Jews in Jerusalem and the Spartans in Greece in the second century BC, in the time of the Maccabean revolt from the Seleucid Greeks. Jonathan was a Jewish leader, the high priest there in Jerusalem, and he sends a letter to the Spartans. And in so many words, he says, hey, we're kinfolks. We both descended from Abraham. Now, he did not say that we are fellow Jews, but rather we're kinfolks, and I think he knew they were of the ten tribes. We'll look later at the Scythians, who in turn looked to these Spartans as allies and possessed a, and proposed a military alliance with them. And these writings and connections between the Spartans, the Jews, and the uh, Scythians suggest that for centuries after the kingdoms of Israel and of Judah fell, the tribes still knew where their scattered kinsmen were located. Now, this was uh, nothing new to them. They could keep up with each other. So, in summary, they went from millions down to only 40,810 in the final captivity by the Assyrians of uh, the Northern Ten. Where did they go? I submit it was in the form of migrations to their colonies, which were spread basically over Europe and Northern Africa. They, went in the, uh, they migrated in the form of the Danans, tribe of Dan, Carthaginians, Celts, Milicians, Spartans. And in the next section, we will see uh, discussion about the Scythians and the Parthians. And there we will find that they were composed of the majority, probably, of the uh, Israelites, the Northern Ten, who took off as the country was about to fall and of captives, uh, those uh, 40,000 some odd that we read about. And they then formed two great nations and empires, especially the Parthian Empire, which uh, we will see showing up later in Europe as we continue this discussion on our 10 lost tribes and end up by discussing where they are today. And I think you'll be amazed at what you see, especially about two of the tribes, that being the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh. Thank you very much. Join us next time.